Government. An essay by 1800's French economist Frederick Bastiat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Government. I wish someone would offer a prize, not of a hundred francs, but of a million, with crowns, medals, and ribbons, for a good, simple, and intelligible definition of the word government. What an immense service it would confer on society. The government? What is it? Where is it? What does it do? What ought it to do? All we know is that it is a mysterious personage, and assuredly it is the most solicited, the most tormented, the most overwhelmed, the most admired, the most accused, the most invoked, and the most provoked of any personage in the world. I have not the pleasure of knowing my reader, but I would stake ten to one that for six months he has been making utopias, and if so, that he is looking to government for the realization of them. And should the reader happen to be a lady, I have no doubt that she is sincerely desirous of seeing all the evils of suffering humanity remedied, and that she thinks this might easily be done if government would only undertake it. But alas, that poor unfortunate personage, like Figaro, knows not to whom to listen, nor where to turn. The hundred thousand mouths of the press and of the platform cry out all at once, Organize labor and workmen. Do away with egotism. Repress insolence and the tyranny of capital. Make experiments upon manure and eggs. Cover the country with railways. Irrigate the plains. Plant the hills. Make model farms. Found social workshops. Colonize Algeria. Suckle children. Instruct the youth. Assist the aged. Send the inhabitants of towns into the country. Equalize the profits of all trades. Lend money without interest to all who wish to borrow. Emancipate Italy, Poland, and Hungary. Rear and perfect the saddle horse. Encourage the arts and provide us with musicians and dancers. Restrict commerce and at the same time create a merchant navy. Discover truth and put a grain of reason into our heads. The mission of government is to enlighten, to develop, to extend, to fortify, to spiritualize, and to sanctify the soul of the people. Do have a little patience, gentlemen, says government in a beseeching tone. I will do what I can to satisfy you, but for this I must have resources. I have been preparing plans for five or six taxes, which are quite new and not at all oppressive. You will see how willingly people will pay them. Then comes the great exclamation, No, indeed! Where is the merit of doing a thing with resources? Why, it does not deserve the name of a government. So far from loading us with fresh taxes, we would have you withdraw the old ones. You ought to suppress the salt tax, the tax on liquors, the tax on letters, custom house duties, patents. <sighs> In the midst of this tumult, and now that the country has two or three times changed its government for not having satisfied all its demands, I wanted to show that they were contradictory. But what could I have been thinking about? Could I not keep this unfortunate observation to myself? I have lost my character forever. I am looked upon as a man without heart and without feeling, a dry philosopher, an individualist, a plebeian. In a word, an economist of the English or American school. But pardon me, sublime writers, who stop at nothing, not even at contradictions. I am wrong without a doubt, and I would willingly retract. I should be glad enough, you may be sure, if you had really discovered a beneficent and inexhaustible being, calling itself the government, which had bread for all mouths, work for all hands, capital for all enterprises, credit for all projects, oil for all wounds, balm for all sufferings, advice for all perplexities, solutions for all doubts, truths for all intellects, diversions for all who want them, milk for infancy and wine for old age, 
which can provide for all our wants satisfy all our curiosity correct all our errors repair all our faults and exempt us henceforth from the necessity of foresight prudence judgment sagacity experience order economy temperance and activity what reason could i have for not desiring to see such a discovery made indeed the more i reflect upon it the more do i see that nothing could be more convenient than that we should all of us have within our reach an inexhaustible source of wealth and enlightenment a universal physician an unlimited treasury and an infallible counsellor such as you describe government to be therefore it is that i want to have it pointed out and defined and that a prize should be offered to the first discoverer of the phoenix for no one would think of asserting that this precious discovery has yet been made since up to this time everything presenting itself under the name of government is immediately overturned by the people precisely because it does not fulfill the rather contradictory conditions of the program i will venture to say that i fear we are in this respect the dupes of one of the strangest delusions which has ever taken possession of the human mind man recoils from trouble from suffering and yet he is condemned by nature to the suffering of privation if he does not take the trouble to work he has to choose then between these two evils what means can he adopt to avoid both there remains now and there will remain only one way which is to enjoy the labor of others such a course of conduct prevents the trouble and the satisfaction from preserving their natural proportion and causes all the trouble to become the lot of one set of persons and all the satisfaction that of another this is the origin of slavery and of plunder whatever its form may be whether that of wars impositions violence restrictions frauds etc monstrous abuses but consistent with the thought which has given them birth oppression should be detested and resisted it can hardly be called absurd slavery is subsiding thank heaven and on the other hand our disposition to defend our property prevents direct and open plunder from being easy one thing however remains it is the original inclination which exists in all men to divide the lot of life into two parts throwing the trouble upon others and keeping the satisfaction for themselves it remains to be shown under what new form this sad tendency is manifesting itself the oppressor no longer acts directly and with his own powers upon his victim no our conscience has become too sensitive for that the tyrant and his victim are still present but there is an intermediate person between them which is the government that is the law itself what can be better calculated to silence our scruples and which is perhaps better appreciated to overcome all resistance we all therefore put in our claim under some pretext or other and apply to government we say to it i am dissatisfied at the proportion between my labor and my enjoyments i should like for the sake of restoring the desired equilibrium to take a part of the possessions of others but this would be dangerous could not you facilitate the thing for me could you not find me a good place or check the industry of my competitors or perhaps lend me gratuitously some capital which you may take from its possessor could you not bring up my children at the public expense or grant me some prizes or secure me a competence when i have attained my fiftieth year by this means i shall gain my end with an easy conscience for the law will have acted for me and i shall have all the advantages of plunder without its risk or its disgrace as it is certain on the one hand that we are all making some similar request of the government and as on the other it is proved that government cannot satisfy one party without adding to the labor of the others until i can obtain another definition of the word government i feel authorized to give my own who knows but that i may obtain the prize here it is government is the great fiction 
through which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else for now as formerly everyone is more or less for profiting by the labors of others no one would dare to profess such a sentiment he even hides it from himself and then what is done a medium is thought of government is applied to and every class in its turn comes to it and says you who can take justifiably and honestly take from the public and we will partake Alas, government is only too much disposed to follow this diabolical advice, for it is composed of ministers and officials, of men in short, who, like all other men, desire in their hearts and always seize every opportunity with eagerness to increase their wealth and influence. Government is not slow to perceive the advantages it may derive from the part which is entrusted to it by the public. It is glad to be the judge and the master of the destinies of all. It will take much, for then a large share will remain for itself. It will multiply the number of its agents. It will enlarge the circle of its privileges. It will end by appropriating a ruinous proportion. But the most remarkable part of it is the astonishing blindness of the public through it all. When successful soldiers used to reduce the vanquished to slavery, they were barbarous, but they were not absurd. Their object, like ours, was to live at other people's expense, and they did not fail to do so. What are we to think of a people who never seem to suspect that reciprocal plunder is no less plunder because it is reciprocal? That it is no less criminal because it is executed legally and with order? that it adds nothing to the public good, that it diminishes it, just in proportion to the cost of the expensive medium which we call the government. And it is this great chimera which we have placed for the edification of the people as the frontispiece to our Constitution. The following is the beginning of the introductory discourse. Quote, France has constituted itself a republic for the purpose of raising all the citizens to an ever-increasing degree of morality, enlightenment, and well-being. Thus it is France, or an abstraction, which is to raise the French, or realities, to morality, well-being, etc., is it not by yielding to this strange delusion that we are led to expect everything from an energy not our own? Is it not giving out that there is, independently of the French, a virtuous, enlightened, and rich being who can and will bestow upon them its benefits? Is not this supposing, and certainly very gratuitously, that there are between France and the French, between the simple, abridged, and abstract denomination of all the individualities, and these individualities themselves, relations as of father to son, tutor to his pupil, professor to his scholar. I know it is often said, metaphorically, the country is a tender mother. But to show the inanity of the constitutional proposition, it is only needed to show that it may be reversed, not only without inconvenience, but even with advantage. Would it be less exact to say, the French have constituted themselves a republic to raise France to an ever-increasing degree of morality, enlightenment, and well-being? Now where is the value of an axiom where the subject and the attribute may change places without inconvenience? Everybody understands what is meant by this. The mother will feed the child, but it would be ridiculous to say the child will feed the mother. The Americans formed another idea of the relations of the citizens with the government when they placed these simple words at the head of their constitution. We, the people of the United States, for the purpose of forming a more perfect union, of establishing justice, of securing interior tranquility, of providing for our common defense, of increasing the general well-being, and of securing the benefits of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, decree, etc. Here there is no chimerical creation, no abstraction from which the citizens may demand everything, they expect nothing except from themselves and their own energy. 
if i may be permitted to criticize the first words of our constitution i would remark that what i complain of is something more than a mere metaphysical subtlety as might seem at first sight i contend that this personification of government has been in past times and will be hereafter a fertile source of calamities and revolutions there is the public on one side government on the other considered as two distinct beings the latter bound to bestow upon the former and the former having the right to claim from the latter all imaginable human benefits what will be the consequence in fact, government is not maimed, and cannot be so. It has two hands, one to receive and the other to give. In other words, it has a rough hand and a smooth one. The activity of the second is necessarily subordinate to the activity of the first. Strictly, government may take and not restore. This is evident, and may be explained by the porous and absorbing nature of its hands, which always retain a part, and sometimes the whole, of what they touch. But the thing that never was seen, and never will be seen, or conceived, is that government can restore more to the public than it has taken from it. It is therefore ridiculous for us to appear before it in the humble attitude of beggars, it is radically impossible for it to confer a particular benefit upon any one of the individualities which constitute the community without inflicting a greater injury upon the community as a whole. Our requisitions, therefore, place it in a dilemma. If it refuses to grant the requests made to it, it is accused of weakness, ill will, and incapacity. If it endeavors to grant them, it is obliged to load the people with fresh taxes, to do more harm than good, and to bring upon itself, from another quarter, the general displeasure. Thus the public has two hopes, and the government makes two promises, many benefits and no taxes, hopes and promises, which, being contradictory, can never be realized. Now, is not this the cause of all our revolutions? For between the government, which lavishes promises which it is impossible to perform, and the public, which has conceived hopes which can never be realized, two classes of men interpose, the ambitious and the utopians. It is circumstances which give these their cue. It is enough if these vassals of popularity cry out to the people, The authorities are deceiving you. If we were in their place, we would load you with benefits and exempt you from taxes. And the people believe, and the people hope, and the people make a revolution. No sooner are their friends at the head of affairs than they are called upon to redeem their pledge. Give us work, bread, assistance, credit, instruction colonies say the people and withal deliver us as you promised from the talons of the exchequer the new government is no less embarrassed than the former one for it soon finds that it is much more easy to promise than to perform it tries to gain time for this is necessary for maturing its vast projects at first it makes a few timid attempts on one hand it institutes a little elementary instruction on the other it makes a little reduction in the liquor tax eighteen fifty but the contradiction is forever starting up before it if it would be philanthropic it must attend to its exchequer if it neglects its exchequer it must abstain from being philanthropic these two promises are forever clashing with each other it cannot be otherwise to live upon credit which is the same as exhausting the future is certainly a present means of reconciling them an attempt is made to do a little good now at the expense of a great deal of harm in future but such proceedings call forth the spectre of bankruptcy which puts an end to credit what is to be done then why then the new government takes a bold step it unites all its forces in order to maintain itself its mother's opinion has recourse to arbitrary measures ridicules its former maxims declares that it is impossible to conduct the administration except at the risk of being unpopular 
In short, it proclaims itself governmental. And it is here that other candidates for popularity are waiting for it. They exhibit the same illusion, pass by the same way, obtain the same success, and are soon swallowed up in the same gulf. We had arrived at this point in February 1849. At this time, the illusion, which is the subject of this article, had made more way than at any former period in the ideas of the people in connection with socialist doctrines. They expected, more firmly than ever, that government, under a republican form, would open in grand style the source of benefits and close that of taxation. We have often been deceived, said the people, but we will see to it ourselves this time, and take care not to be deceived again. What could the provisional government do? Alas, just that which always is done in similar circumstances, make promises and gain time. It did so, of course, and to give its promises more weight, it announced them publicly thus. Increase of prosperity, diminution of labor, assistance, credit, gratuitous instruction, agricultural colonies, cultivation of waste land, and at the same time reduction of the tax on salt, liquor, letters, meat. All this shall be granted when the National Assembly meets. The National Assembly meets, and as it is impossible to realize two contradictory things, its task, its sad task, is to withdraw, as gently as possible, one after the other, all the decrees of the provisional government. However, in order somewhat to mitigate the cruelty of the deception, it is found necessary to negotiate a little. Certain engagements are fulfilled, others are in a measure begun, and therefore the new administration is compelled to contrive some new taxes. Now I transport myself in thought to a period a few months hence, and ask myself with sorrowful forebodings what will come to pass when the agents of the new government go into the country to collect new taxes upon legacies, revenues, and the profits of agricultural traffic. It is to be hoped that my presentiments may not be verified, but I foresee a difficult part for the candidates for popularity to play. Read the last manifesto of the Montagnards, that which they issued on the occasion of the election of the President. It is rather long, but at length it concludes with these words. Government ought to give a great deal to the people and take little from them. It is always the same tactics, or rather, the same mistake. Government is bound to give gratuitous instruction and education to all the citizens. It is bound to give a general and appropriate professional education as much as possible adapted to the wants, the callings, and the capacities of each citizen. It is bound to teach every citizen his duty to God, to man, and to himself, to develop his sentiments, his tendencies, and his faculties, to teach him, in short, the scientific part of his labor, to make him understand his own interests, and to give him a knowledge of his rights. It is bound to place within the reach of all literature and the arts, the patrimony of thought, the treasures of the mind, and all those intellectual enjoyments which elevate and strengthen the soul. <laughs> it is bound to give compensation for every accident, from fire, inundation, etc., experienced by a citizen. The etc. means more than it says. It is bound to attend to the relations of capital with labor and to become the regulator of credit. It is bound to afford important encouragement and efficient protection to agriculture. It is bound to purchase railroads, canals, and mines, and doubtless to transact affairs with that industrial capacity which characterizes it. It is bound to encourage useful experiments to promote and assist them by every means likely to make them successful. As a regulator of credit, it will exercise such extensive influence over industrial and agricultural associations as shall ensure them success. 
Government is bound to do all this, in addition to the services to which it is already pledged. And further, it is always to maintain a menacing attitude towards foreigners, for, according to those who signed the program, bound together by this holy union and by the precedence of the French Republic, we carry our wishes and hopes beyond the boundaries which despotism has placed between nations. The rights which we desire for ourselves, we desire for all those who are oppressed by the yoke of tyranny. We desire that our glorious army should still, if necessary, be the army of liberty. You see that gentle hand of government, that good hand which gives and distributes, will be very busy under the government of the Montagnards. You think, perhaps, that it will be the same with the rough hand, that hand which dives into our pockets? Do not deceive yourselves. <clears throat> the aspirants after popularity would not know their trade if they had not the art when they show the gentle hand to conceal the rough one. Their reign will assuredly be the jubilee of the taxpayers. It is superfluities, not necessaries, they say, which ought to be taxed. Truly, it will be a good time when the exchequer, for the sake of loading us with benefits, will content itself with curtailing our superfluities. This is not all. The Montagnards intend that taxation shall lose its oppressive character and be only an act of fraternity. Good heavens! I know it is the fashion to thrust fraternity in everywhere, but I did not imagine it would ever be put into the hands of the tax-gatherer. To come to the details, those who signed the program say, We desire the immediate abolition of those taxes which affect the absolute necessaries of life, as salt, liquors, etc., etc. The reform of the tax on landed property, customs, and patents. Gratuitous justice, that is, the simplification of its forms and the reduction of its expenses. This, no doubt, has reference to stamps. Thus, the tax on landed property, customs, patents, stamps, salt, liquors, postage, are all included. These gentlemen have found out the secret of giving an excessive activity to the gentle hand of government, while they entirely paralyze its rough hand. Well, I ask the impartial reader, is it not childishness, and more than that, dangerous childishness? Is it not inevitable that we shall have revolution after revolution if there is a determination never to stop till this contradiction is realized, to give nothing to government and to receive much from it? If the Montagnards were to come into power, would they not become the victims of the means which they employed to take possession of it? Citizens, in all times, two political systems have been in existence, and each may be maintained by good reasons. According to one of them, government ought to do much, but then it ought to take much. According to the other, this twofold activity ought to be little felt. We have to choose between these two systems, but as regards the third system, which partakes of both the others, and which consists in exacting everything from government without giving it anything, it is chimerical, absurd, childish, contradictory, and dangerous. Those who parade it for the sake of the pleasure of accusing all governments of weakness and thus exposing them to your attacks are only flattering and deceiving you while they are deceiving themselves. For ourselves, we consider that government is and ought to be nothing whatever but common force organized, not to be an instrument of oppression and mutual plunder among citizens, but on the contrary, to secure to every one his own and to cause justice and security to reign. End of Government by Frederick Bastiat Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in July 2019.